There are two main views on human origins, biblical creation and Darwinian evolution. Now, there are those that try to have it both ways, but they are logically incompatible with each other. Also, there are other views that exist, but the proponents are few, and they do not seem to have a complete theory. Intelligent design, while a useful tool, generally falls under the category of trying to have it both ways. Both biblical creation and Darwinian evolution are fundamental concepts of history that produce ideas about human origins. We will look at what both predict about human genetics and compare that to actual data to see which fits the facts the best. According to the Bible, man was a special creation of God about 6,000 years ago without any common ancestors with any animals. Then about 1,600 years later, there was a global flood that killed all but eight people on the ark. These survivors were Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. It is from the three sons and their wives that all living human beings are descended. Biblical creation predicts that while we should expect some genetic similarities with similar animals such as apes, there should still be considerable genetic differences. There should be a three-way split in our DNA with the starting point in the Middle East. Actual mutation rates should point to a common human ancestor about 6,000 years ago, or possibly the time of the Genesis flood 4,400 years ago. There should be considerable variety within kinds of animals, but no transitions between these kinds. A key test to two species being the same kind is interbreedability. Now, variations can result from natural adaptation, but there would be limits to how much variation can occur. The DNA information system should be highly complex and, in fact, be shown to be more and more complex as we learn more about it. It should be designed with a large degree of flexibility to allow organisms to adapt to different environments. Darwinian evolution is not just the idea that life changes over time. Creationists actually agree with this form of evolution. According to Darwinian evolution, not only do human beings have a common ancestor with apes, but with every other living thing on the planet. This idea of universal common descent is a critical component of Darwinian evolution. The simple fact is that according to Darwinian evolution, you are actually related to a banana and everything else that you eat. As a result, according to Darwinian evolution, we are all essentially cannibals, eating our distant cousins every day. And this is true even of vegetarians. According to Darwinian evolution, apes are our closest relatives, with chimpanzees being our closest relative of all. From all this, we can make several predictions about what we should find in our DNA. One prediction is that large sections of our DNA should be largely junk left over from the evolutionary process. Another prediction is that our DNA should be very similar to that of apes and chimps in particular. Two ape chromosomes must have fused to form one of ours since apes have 24 pairs of chromosomes and humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Humans would not all be descended from one original couple, but a group of humans that evolved from earlier forms. Modern humans would have been around for at least hundreds of thousands of years, but not millions of years. The DNA information system should be as simple as possible, with small changes in DNA not affecting much of the information content. Large portions of our DNA should be useless evolutionary leftovers from past forms. Life should be infinitely variable, allowing all life on Earth to evolve from a single cell ancestor. Natural selection must be a good enough filter of random mutations to add information to genomes over time. Cells are the basic building blocks of living organisms. An organism can be a single cell or it can be made of billions of cells, such as a human being. In Darwin's day, they only had optical microscopes, under which cells looked like little more than bags of fluid. The result was that the notion that life could have risen spontaneously, that is, abiogenesis, 
seemed reasonable. The Darwin's theory did not deal with the origin of life itself. That origin is still an important part of the theory. Because without the first cell, there is nothing to evolve. The invention of the electron microscope showed that cells are far more complex than was ever imagined. This should have been the end of the notion of abiogenesis. But it was too important a part of Darwinian evolution for it to be given up. Besides, the alternative of creation by God had already been eliminated as a starting assumption, making some form of abiogenesis necessary. The simple fact is that living cells have such a high degree of organized complexity that abiogenesis can be shown to be thermodynamically impossible. This high degree of organized complexity includes several different types of organs that perform many different functions. The two types we will be looking at are the nucleus and mitochondria. These contain a cell's DNA. The nucleus contains most of the DNA of a cell, and this DNA we get equally from both parents. The mitochondria are the powerhouses of a cell, and they contain a relatively small portion of DNA that we only get from our mothers. This DNA has a lot to say about the origin of human beings. Deoxynucleic acid, known more commonly as DNA, is the information storage system of living cells. This is more than a chemical system, but a fully functional, highly complex information system. The information it stores is not based on the chemistry of the DNA, but it is an arbitrary encoded information storage system. DNA forms a double helix consisting of adenine, thionine, and cysteine guanine pairs bound by a sugar substrate structure. The result is no chemical favoring of any specific sequential arrangement of these pairs, even allowing all four bases to be on both sides of the double helix. The result is that DNA could in theory be used to store any type of information someone would want to store in it. DNA is the densest information storage system known to exist, with the information being encoded at the molecular level. It can store a whopping 10 to the 19 bits per cubic centimeter, which is a thousand times more than a flash drive at 10 to the 16 bits per cubic centimeter. In fact, all the data in the world could be stored on one kilogram, that is 2.2 pounds, of DNA. In common usage, genes are units of heredity transferred from parent to offspring that determine some characteristics of that offspring. In technical uses, genes are often limited to DNA sequences that encode instructions for making proteins. The difference between these two definitions can cause confusion since protein encoding DNA makes up only about 2% of our total DNA. As a result, some scientific discoveries have been used as pro-Darwin evolution propaganda that do not necessarily support it, since the speakers and listener can easily be thinking of different things from the word gene. A more accurate and up-to-date definition, taking the results of the ECODE project into consideration, would be a gene is a unit of genomic sequences encoding a coherent set of potentially overlapping functional products. This definition fits well enough with common usage that it avoids the confusion of the other definition. This is also the definition that will be used hereafter. DNA sequences are generally printed out with the first letter of the encoding part of the nucleotide, resulting in A for adenine, T for thionine, C for cytosine, and G for glutenine. The result is that the printout of a DNA sequence looks something like this, with nucleotides printed out in groups of 10 to make locating them easier. This is the actual HH772046 gene for human beings. It is easy to think of the information stored in DNA as being stored in a simple linear fashion, like the information on a tape. But this is an oversimplified way of looking at it. In reality, the DNA information system is far more complex than that, with overlapping genes and 
a three-dimensional structure to how the DNA in its information is stored in the nucleus of a cell. In fact, the more it is studied, the more complex the DNA information system proves to be. Much of this complexity does not show up when simply looking at a printout of a DNA sequence because the encoding of the sequences could be in one block of code, it could be in multiple blocks of code, and the code can overlap. Look at the sentence, when harvest time comes, all of it will happen. Now within this sentence, there's another sentence. When the time comes, it will happen. Now these sentences are similar, but they're not identical. Take a look at this text. Apollo put man on the moon will be full tonight. There are two sentences here that overlap. Apollo will put man on the moon, and the moon will be full tonight. What is in common is the moon. Epigenetics involves potentially heritable changes in DNA expression without changes in the actual DNA sequence. These changes affect how cells read the genes, resulting in a change in active and inactive genes. Epigenetic changes between types of cells tells a given cell what type of cell it is to be, such as skin, heart, liver, or brain. When epigenetic changes go wrong, they can cause many diseases, including cancer. This is one of the reasons why it is an important area of study. It also adds yet another layer of complexity to the genetic information system. What more do we have yet to discover? Each chromosome in a human cell has about a meter-long string of DNA. This DNA is rolled up with various proteins to form a chromosome. These proteins both roll up the DNA and serve as epigenetic markers. These external markers influence how tightly the DNA is wound. This affects gene expression because tightly wound genes cannot be expressed while loosely wound genes can be easily expressed. There are also methyl markers that attach themselves directly to the DNA strand. These markers not only turn on and off genes, but also affect how they are read. The reason why the winding in the markers affect how and when genes are read is that they affect the accessibility of the genes to the reading mechanism. When epigenetic changes go wrong, they often cause disease. These diseases include cancer, leading to efforts to treat cancer by trying to reverse the flawed epigenetic changes rather than killing the cells. While epigenetic changes are passed on through cell division within an organism, most are erased during reproduction. However, some epigenetic changes are passed from parent to child. These epigenetic changes within a kind of animal allow for a lot of variety within that kind of animal, resulting from environmental influences making it a useful tool for adaptation to different environments. Epigenetic changes seem to be a major factor in adaptation by changing what genetic information is used and how it is used. There are limits to the amount of change that can occur by this means since there is no change in the genetic information content. This is actually a problem for Darwinian evolution, which requires large amounts of new information. By showing that much of the changes actually observed in living things is not the new information needed by universal common descent. The fact is that genetic information is far more complex than was originally thought and far more complex than what Darwinian evolution predicts. This complexity also shows that even small changes in the genetic code can have large negative effects on an organism, making Darwinian evolution's need for new information even harder to achieve. If epigenetic changes are responsible for much of the observed variety observed among living things, it suggests that there are limits to the amount of change that can occur. Furthermore, the high degree of complexity found in genetic information greatly reduced the possibility of producing the genetic information system by naturalistic processes. The wind evolution is based on the idea that small variations in organisms being acted on by natural selection over time have produced all of the variation of life on Earth from a single common ancestor. One of the problems is that Darwin had no real idea as to what the source of those small variations is. The discovery of DNA has led to the idea 
The mutations in the DNA sequences produce the changes in natural selection filters out the duds while supporting the beneficial changes. Natural selection is often compared to artificial selection used by humans in breeding animals, but these processes are not the same. Artificial selection is the deliberate choosing of particular traits that are desirable to those doing the selection. Furthermore, the selected traits are often not beneficial to the animals. Natural selection, on the other hand, does no real choosing of traits, and in fact, does not focus on specific traits with its only real goal being survival, meaning that, at best, it just filters out bad mutations. This is how evolution is often implied, the effects of mutations are distributed. Furthermore, even when they admit that most mutations are at least a little harmful, it is always implied that a reasonable percentage are beneficial. One trick is to insist that mutation is beneficial when it produces an environment-specific benefit that is generally harmful to the organism. The theory would work best if the effects of mutations nearly followed the bell curve with a narrow range of low selective pressure in the middle. If it were real, this would provide a strong enough selection that evolution might have a chance. However, it is not real, and not even close to being real. The reality is that most mutations are slightly harmful. As mutations get more and more harmful, the numbers get smaller and smaller. There are also probably an extremely few slightly, truly beneficial mutations. The problem is that the extremely few slightly, truly beneficial mutations are too small to have any selective pressure. The majority of selection is against the relatively few highly harmful mutations and the accumulation of many smaller ones. The result is that natural selection serves mainly as a conservative filter, filtering out the really bad, deadly mutations. It also does allow mutations that have some environmental benefit to be passed on, even though that mutation is generally harmful. Such mutations result from a loss of specialization, making the organism generally weaker than the non-mutant. But the mutation just happens to allow the mutant to survive an unusual situation. A good example of a generally less fit organism having a survival advantage under special conditions can be illustrated with wolves and chihuahuas. Lock a dozen wolves and chihuahuas in a room. Give them water, but no food. In a week, you will only have wolves because they will have eaten the chihuahuas. Now let's redo this experiment by mounting a bunch of remote-controlled machine guns around the room at about two feet high. Within seconds of turning on the guns, the only living dogs in the room will be the chihuahuas because all of the wolves will have been shot. In reality, natural selection boils down to a conservative filter that allows some mutations to aid in adaptation at the expense of the general fitness of the organism and a loss of genetic information. Natural selection also works on epigenetic changes, resulting in what are often reversible adaptations to environmental changes where the actual genetic information is conserved. Part of our DNA encodes for proteins, but most of it does not. Now, not knowing what this non-encoding DNA does, evolutionists assumed, based on Darwinian evolution, that it was useless junk left over from the evolutionary process. As a result, this non-encoding DNA has been labeled junk DNA by evolutionists in typical propaganda style. However, a research project called ENCODE has shown that most and probably all of this so-called junk DNA has a function. Most of this functionality involves regulating the protein encoding genes and similar functions. So junk DNA is nothing more than evolutionary propaganda. It is not junk, but important, fully functional DNA. You have probably heard the claim that human DNA is 98 or even 99% similar to that of a chimpanzee. These figures are often quoted without explaining how the two genomes were actually compared. The fact is that this claim is more propaganda 
than science. While the figures are based on a scientific comparison, it is not the entire story, even from the actual study on which it is based. You may have seen drawings such as these, comparing the chromosomes of humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. In these drawings, the respective chromosomes look a lot alike. In our chromosome too, looks as though it is a perfect match to a fusion of the ape chromosomes. However, it needs to remember that these are drawings and not actual pictures. And these drawings suffer an awful lot from evolutionary assumptions. Despite the fact that these drawings are highly biased towards similarity, they still show enough differences to show that the claim of 98 to 99 percent similarity between human and chimpanzee DNA is a myth. Depictions such as these are often used to show the alleged similarity between human and apes, and particularly chimpanzees, making them great pro-evolution propaganda tools. In fact, if this is all you knew about the similarities between chimps and humans, it would be quite convincing. The fact that these drawings are highly biased towards similarity is evident when you look at the actual images of the chromosomes. These are actual pictures of the human, chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan chromosomes. Now while they do show some similarities, they also show considerable differences and far more than you would see in the hand-drawn illustrations. By the way, the webpage that I originally saw this on was entitled, This Picture Has Creationist Scared. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not scared by it. In fact, it actually helps illustrate many of the differences between humans and apes. Another thing this illustrates is the bias that evolutionists have in interpreting data, since they seem to think this actually helps their case. Despite actually being described as pictorial evidence for the similarity between human, chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan chromosomes, this set of chromosome images shows considerable differences. These pictures further show the claim human and chimpanzee DNA is 98 to 99 percent similar to be false and nothing more than propaganda. However, despite the clear differences shown by these visual depictions, it is the actual numerical count of differences that busts the 98 to 99 percent similarity myth wide open. The comparing of human and chimpanzee DNA that yields the 98 to 99 percent figure, actual figure is 98.7 7% is not a result of starting at one end of each chromosome and tabulating the nucleotides that match and do not match. Doing that would produce an embarrassingly low figure with no propaganda value. To get the 98.77% figure, they actually have to ignore a significant portion of both genomes. What they do is they enter a segment of one genome into a computer program that finds the segment most easily aligned with it in the other. They then only count the substitutions, which are places where one nucleotide is swapped for another, and not the indels, which are one or more nucleotides that are found in one and not the other. When the indels are added, there is an additional 3% worth of differences resulting in a similarity of 95.89% in these already aligned sections. To get the real amount of similarity, it is necessary to include those portions that cannot be aligned. What is not included in the comparison is 18% of chimpanzee DNA and 25% of human DNA. This means that the actual percentage that is not aligned with that of chimpanzees is 25%. This means that only 75% of human DNA can be aligned with chimpanzee DNA. When you apply the percentage similarity in those segments that do align, you get a similarity of only 71.92%. This actual percentage of similarity between human and chimp genomes of 71.92% is a far cry from the 98.77% similarity quoted by evolutionists. The 29.08 actual difference goes against the notion that humans and chimps had a common ancestor. So why do evolutionists keep quoting the 98.77% figure? 
One reason is ignorance. That is, they have heard the 98.77% figure as true without really knowing where it comes from. The other is that the 98.77% figure makes great propaganda. And when you have the courts keeping alternative views out of public schools, they have no one to challenge such claims. The fact is that human and chimpanzee genomes are only 71.92% similar and not 98.77% as claimed by evolutionists. The myth that human and chimpanzee DNA is 98 to 99% similar is totally busted. As a result, evolutionists are desperate to try to prove human chromosome 2 fusion theory because without it, their entire worldview collapses. In their drawings of patterns of human chromosome 2 in the three great apes chromosome 2a and 2b labeled by evolutionists, they are made to look so similar that they seem to prove the fusion theory. These drawings make such good propaganda that if this was all you were given, you would be convinced not only of human chromosome 2 fusion theory, but that we must have a common ancestor with chimpanzees and other apes. However, when you look at actual images of the chromosomes, the similarity all but disappears. True, there are some similarities in the patterns, but chimp chromosome 2b has a segment not found in human chromosome 2, right near the alleged fusion point, and on the wrong side of it. Furthermore, this is just the tip of the genetic iceberg that goes against human chromosome 2 fusion theory. Before we go on, I have to make this fact clear, and that is that human chromosome fusion theory, even if proven true, would not prove we have a common ancestor with apes. It is quite possible that the original humans, Adam and Eve, were created with 24 pairs of chromosomes and a subsequent fusion event occurred, reducing it to 23. Biblically, this could have happened at the fall or any time before Noah's flood. So if human chromosome 2 fusion theory were proven, it would have no effect on biblical creation. Evolutionists, on the other hand, need human chromosome 2 fusion theory to be true because their entire worldview requires it. As a result, evolutionists will use any scrap of data they can find to try to support it, and they will ignore and dismiss any evidence that goes against it. Since evolutionists need human chromosome 2 fusion and creationists have no problem if it is true, creationists can be totally objective on the topic, while evolutionists desperately need it it cannot be even remotely objective. The main evidence claimed for human chromosome 2 fusion theory are the alleged fusion site and the alleged inactive centimere that would coincide with the centimere on a chromosome 2b. While the claim of an inactive centimere is made, it has not been possible to find a copy of the actual nucleotide sequence. There is far more information on the alleged fusion site, and it actually yields problems for human chromosome 2 fusion theory. As stated earlier, the actual nucleotide sequence for the alleged inactive centimere is not available, making a personal study of the site impossible. However, an inactive centimere would contain a set of highly variable repetitive sequences called alpha satellite DNA, or alphoid DNA for short. The fact that alpha satellite DNA is highly variable is likely the reason it is hard to find since it would make poor propaganda. Why this alphoid DNA is found in centimeres, they are not unique to centimeres. Also the alleged centimere is way too small and while some of the alphoid DNA does get deleted in an inactive centimere, it is not enough to account for the small size. The simple fact is that the evidence for a second remnant centimere at any stage of sequence degeneracy is negligible and nowhere near enough to objectively say it is an inactive centimere. Furthermore, alphoid DNA is not unique to centimeres, but are found elsewhere in both human and chimpanzee genomes. And they do not necessarily occur in the same place in human and chimpanzee genomes. Furthermore, they are more plentiful in the human genome than in the chimp. The chart on the left shows the alphoid DNA sequences in the human 
genome. And the chart on the right shows the alphoid sequences in the chimpanzee genome. Notice that there are many times more alphoid sequences in the human genome than in the chimpanzee. Here is a comparison between the alphoid sequences found in human chromosome 2 and those found in chimpanzee chromosome 2a and 2b. Note that the chimpanzee chromosome 2a and b have only three alphoid DNA sequence sets between them, while the human chromosome 2 has eight. Also, the chimpanzee chromosome 2 fusion is actually longer than the human chromosome 2. Here is the actual sequence of the alleged fusion site. A telomere is essentially a DNA end cap with a repetitive sequence of TTAGGG. These end caps are usually tens of thousands of base pairs long, but the alleged fusion site is only hundreds of base pairs. However, since the shorting of the end caps tends to promote fusion, this may not be a problem. If this were a head-to-head fusion, we would expect to see repeats of TTAGGG and the reverse sequence CCCTAA on the opposite side of the fusion site. It should also include many repeats of the alternatives TCAGGG, TGAGGG, CCAGA, and CCCTCA on the respective sides. These repeat sequences should be clumped together on both sides of the fusion site. If this were really a fusion site, we should expect it to look something like this. In reality, the alleged fusion site looks something like this, with the repeat sequences scattered among other sequences. And one of the reverse sequences is actually found on the wrong side of the alleged fusion. Going only on the basis of sequences, there is enough similarity to a telomere that if one wants to consider this a fusion site, you can see it that way. However, the site is enough unlike a telomere that it cannot be objectively or conclusively considered a telomere fusion site. Remember, evolutionists need this to be a telomere fusion site, but their theory is done for. Furthermore, there are good reasons why this probably is not a telomere fusion site. These sequences are not unique to telomeres, but occur in several places in the human genome. Among these are gene transcription factor binding sites. In human beings, the area around the alleged fusion site contains a number of genes not found in chimpanzees. The three axon variant of the DDX11L2 gene, which produces an important non-encoding RNA, crosses the alleged fusion site. The DDX11L2 gene was originally labeled a pseudogene that was thought by evolutionists not to have any function. But the ENCODE project found that it not only is functional, but regulates the DDX11 gene, which encodes for the important DDX11 protein. Not only does this gene cross the alleged fusion site, as seen here, but the alleged fusion site actually contains one of the transcription factor binding sites for this gene. This fact strongly shows that this is not a fusion site. Particularly the fact that one of the gene's transcription factor binding sites is inside the alleged fusion site. Since it shows that the alleged fusion site is an active segment of DNA, one final fact to note is that when the actual sequences of human chromosome 2 and chimpanzee chromosome 2a and 2b are compared, including the unalignable DNA, they are only 66.2% similar. And the alleged fusion site is part of the unalignable DNA. The Bible clearly states that all mankind is descended from one man and woman, Adam and Eve. 
and in recent years, genetic studies have shown this to be the case. One interesting outcome of these studies is support for the fact that our most recent female ancestor, Eve, is actually older than our most recent common male ancestor, Noah. And of the two lines of study, the one point to Eve is the most interesting. This data provides compelling evidence for biblical history. It also stands as an example for how evolutionary interpretation actually obscures evidence in support of the biblical account. Furthermore, it shows the lengths evolutionists will go to to dismiss such evidence. Mitochondrial DNA is DNA found in the mitochondria of a cell. Unlike nuclear DNA, which we get from both our father and mother, we only get mitochondrial DNA from our mother. This makes measuring changes in the DNA easier. In 1987, a team at the University of California at Berkeley compared the mitochondrial DNA of several groups of people from different geographical locations. They concluded that all these people had the same female ancestor and called her mitochondrial leave. They then proceeded to calculate the mutation rate based on such evolutionary assumptions as the time of our alleged divergence from a supposed common ancestor with chimps. Quoting from a 2000 study that made the same assumption, from the mean genetic distance between all the humans and the one chimpanzee sequence, and the assumption based on paleontology and genetic evidence of a divergent time between humans and chimpanzees five million years ago, the mutation rate for the mitochondrial molecule, excluding the D-loop, is estimated to be 1.70 times 10 to the negative 8 substitutions per site per year. Based on, they included, based on this estimated mutation rate, the mitochondrial E lived between 100,000 and 200,000 years ago. In 1997, a paper entitled A High Observed Substitution Rate in the Human Mitochondrial DNA Control Region by Parsons Thomas et al. was published in Nature Genetics. They compared the mitochondrial DNA of many mother-child peers and found that mutation rates in mitochondrial DNA occurred about 20 times more rapidly than previously thought. Based on these measurements, they calculated mitochondrial Eve lived only about 6,500 years ago. This is about the time the Bible gives for when the real Eve lived. Further research has been done in this area, and they are quite interesting. Parsons later combined his research with others, calibrating the molecular clock, resulting in a figure of one mutation per 1,200 years, which is one-tenth the evolutionary estimate and one and a half times Parsons' original figure. For an estimated date of mitochondrial Eve of 10,000 years, which is still in the general ballpark of the biblical account. The only real reason these figures are rejected is because it agrees with the Bible while being contrary to evolution. Now, it is possible that mitochondrial Eve is not actually Eve herself, but one of her female descendants. She would be the last common ancestor of Noah's three sons' wives. Eve could have been the last common ancestor of these three women, but that ancestor could have been one of Eve's pre-flood female descendants. Also, the difference between the biblical figure and the approximate figure of 10,000 years would only require a slight elevation of the mutation rate at some time in the past. The Geographic Project is a project started by the National Geographic Society, IBM, Genesis Spencer Wells, and the Watts Family Foundation. The idea is to determine the migration pattern starting in Africa and going to the rest of the world. The conclusions are based largely on the assumption of evolution. They show it starting in Nambia, in Africa, based entirely on an evolutionary interpretation of the fossil record. This evolutionary interpretation of data also influences the migration atlas and genetic relations graphs. Despite this fact, the data has presented by the National Geographic still shows indications of the post babel dispersion as mentioned in the Bible. The apparent trends showing migration from Nambia are 100% interpretation. 
The raw data in this study is a bunch of mitochondrial and Y chromosome DNA samples from various parts of the world. We get mitochondrial DNA only from our mother and Y chromosome DNA only from our father. From this data, it is possible to show which lines are more closely related to which. But to project back in origin requires making assumptions about where that origin was. Those who did this study made the evolutionary assumption that the origin was in Nambia. However, one can also make the biblical assumption that it started in Iraq. Both are arbitrary assumptions and they produce different directions in some of the migrational trends. Unfortunately, the public is not told about the assumptions made in these studies. In fact, the evolutionists that did it probably did not realize that starting in Nambia is an arbitrary assumption. This interpretation is supported by their own family trees of both mitochondrial and Y chromosome lines. This is particularly evident in the Y chromosome line where M89, the one in Iraq, has about twice as many offshoots as the other lines combined. A similar pattern can be seen in the mitochondrial line. In both cases, if you place the ancestor marker in Iraq, the distribution of descendants is more even than if you place it in Africa. One other thing about this Bible that supports the Bible is that there's a three-way split in both the mitochondrial and Y chromosome lines when one starts in Iraq. Now Noah had three sons and three daughters-in-law. Since the Bible does not indicate that Noah and his wife had any kids after the flood, we would expect a three-way split, and that is what we have. This chart takes the National Geographic's relationships and migration routes at face value. They are distorted somewhat by the evolutionary assumptions in National Geographic's chart and map. However, despite this influence of evolution, the three-way split from Noah's three daughters-in-law is clearly seen when one starts in Iraq. It's also possible based on both map and family tree data to show with a fair degree of probability which line came from which daughter-in-law. It also indicates that Mrs. Shem and Mrs. Jashif were more closely related to each other than they were to Mrs. Ham. This chart takes National Geographic's relationships and migration routes at face value. It is likely that they are distorted somewhat by evolutionary assumptions. However, despite the influence of evolution, the three-way split from Noah's three sons is clearly seen when one starts in Iraq. It is also possible, based on both the map and family tree data, to show, with a fair degree of probability, which line came from which son. The result is that even though this data, as presented by National Geographic, is loaded with evolutionary assumptions, it still shows patterns consistent with the biblical account. Most likely, if all of the evolutionary assumptions in this map could be stripped away, it would probably show even more consistent the simple fact is that despite all of the hype from evolutionists, genetic evidence does not support the idea that we had a common ancestor with chimpanzees or any of the great apes. The claims of evidence are based mainly on evolutionary assumptions and not objective science. The complexity of genetic information is beyond what could be expected by way of natural processes and chance. Natural selection is simply not a good enough filter to do the job required by Darwinian evolution, lacking the needed specificity to produce any form of new information from random mutations. The comparison of human and chimpanzee genomes and the reporting of the results suffers from evolutionary presuppositions, with much of the reporting being largely propaganda. The reality is that human and chimpanzee genomes are not 98 to 99 percent similar as is often claimed, but only 71.92% similar, which is a huge difference. Not only is human chromosome 2 fusion theory not objectively supported by the evidence, but the presence of an important gene at the alleged fusion site kills the claim. Both mitochondrial and Y chromosome DNA supports a recent common ancestor for all human beings, as the Bible says, while supporting the biblical account of the flood in the Tower of Babel. 
When taken as a whole, apart from evolutionary assumptions and propaganda, genetic data does not support Darwinian evolution, but actually supports biblical creation. This genetic data shows we were created by God and do not have a common ancestor with plants or animals.